Good morning. Good morning. This is Monday, October 25th, 1999, here in Natick, Massachusetts. And this is part of the Morse Institute Library Continuing Veterans Oral History Project. This morning we have with us Lou Oxford. Lou, may I ask you what your age is, please? I'm 72. 72, and what is your address? Natick. Here in Natick. Yes. And current marital status? I'm married. You have children? I have two, three children and uh, four grandchildren. I was just going to ask, and <laughs> yes. grandchildren, how old are they? They are, uh, let's see, six, five, uh, two, and eight months. Eight months. <laughs> That's a newcomer in the family. Yes. Where were you born, Lou? I was born in Cambridge, Massachusetts. And where were you raised? I was raised in Woburn. Woburn. Uh, so you moved into Natick about when? 1956. Been in Natick about 43 years. So you came to Natick after the war, after yes. the First World War. Yes. Yeah. Second World War. After the Second World War. And yes. how come your family came here, or you came here? I um, was teaching at Wayland High School, and we wanted to be closer to the school. Mm -hmm. So we found a home in Natick. And so were you a teacher in civilian life, or are you? Yes. I, yeah. Yes, I'm a retired, well, guidance counselor. I taught for a few years first, and then became a guidance counselor. Very good for yeah. you. What was Natick like when you got here in 56? Well, it, uh, um, I don't think it was smaller, but I, I'm not sure of the exact figures, but it was, uh, we thought a very nice little community, a good community to raise our children in. We, we had uh, one that was just three months old at the time, and uh, my oldest daughter was uh, two, I guess, at that time, and we thought this would be a nice uh, place to raise our children. Mm -hmm. I was, I live in North Natick, so I was close to the Wayland line, but uh, not in, in Wayland. We, we just thought this was a very nice New England town to raise our family in. And what was your family background? What did your folks do? My father was a carpenter, and there were, uh, I had two brothers and a sister, and, um, um, my older brother was in the Navy and my younger brother later on uh, after the war, but um, it was, um, I don't know how to describe the family except that uh, it was a close-knit family and uh, we enjoyed each other's company. In fact, my younger brother and I are really friends, not just brothers. That's a nice thing to say. Yes. Now, can you tell me uh, when and where did you enter the military? Yes, I, um, I graduated from high school in 1944, but uh, I could not enter the branches that interested me. I wanted to fly in the worst way. And I had had the right courses, but I'm, I have a color difficulty, and so every time I would take the physical exam, it was turned down. So I went to work for a tree company for a couple of months, but then in November, with all my friends gone and still that nagging feeling of wanting to do my part, I, um, I was able to enlist in the Coast Guard. And so on November 4th, I think it was 1944, I enlisted in the Coast Guard Reserve. Why did you join the military? Well, I, I really had a feeling as though, my, my older brother was in the Navy at the time, he'd been in a couple of years, and I, my father had been a soldier in World War I for the Canadian Army, and I just really felt it was uh, a duty to perform. I wanted to do my part. And most of my friends were gone. I just really felt kind of alone after three yes. or four months out of high school. And so, Did so others I, of your friends uh, go into the Coast Guard, or were they in other branches? No, I had two friends who did, but there were others in other branches, of course. But two. Uh, Two friends uh, actually enlisted with me in the Coast Guard. This, uh, you raise a question here. Um, if you had a color difficulty, mm -hmm. why was that acceptable in the Coast Guard and not the other services? Well, this is a... Uh, why was it not a detriment in the... In the well, I think it probably was because I was only allowed to be a steward's mate in the Coast Guard. I finally um, um, was able to get into another part of the Coast Guard before I was discharged, but uh, um, they were taking um, 
they were taking uh, young men with different kinds of uh, difficulties, underweight, uh, whatever, in my case the color difficulty, and uh, I was allowed to be in the Coast Guard as a steward's mate. My older brother, who made the Navy, you know, quotas make, a, make the decision sometimes, and he, he could only get into the Seabees, which was a great outfit, I thought, but now at the time I was ready to enlist, they weren't taking uh, uh, men with, with a color perception problem. So. Did you join th uh, in Boston? Yes, yes. And where were you sent for basic training? Brooklyn, uh, Sheepshead Bay, Brooklyn, New York. What was that like? Well, that was a, it was a shorter kind of boot training uh, because of the work I was going to be doing. Plus, I contracted the scarlet fever during boot camp. It was, there was an epidemic there. And so I spent two weeks of that shortened training in the uh, hospital, although I wasn't really very ill. So um, then from there, uh, they sent a group of us to um, New London, Connecticut to work at the academy and I got some more advanced training in, uh, in Stewart's Maine. Plus I got some military training handling uh, small arms and, and that kind of thing and, and we did some military drills and so on. So, um, but I was, there f I was there in the Coast Guard Academy for about a year working as a Stewart's Maine, although part of the time I was allowed to work with the gardeners and I thought, well, now I'm going to be able to do something else because I had been with Bartlett tree experts between high school and entering the Coast Guard and they allowed me to work with the trees and, and the uh, grounds and so on, but uh, couldn't change my rate, I guess, and, and so I remained as a steward's mate and finally, after a while, shipped out of there. Uh, At the end of uh, 1944, can you tell me what was the emphasis in the Coast Guard? Um, offshore training or patrolling? Well, I think both, but it would surprise you to know that, that many Coast Guardsmen were overseas. I had a friend who um, uh, was down in the, in the uh, South Pacific as a Coast Guardsman, and I myself got aboard a ship that uh, went to Japan as a Coast Guardsman. It was a Navy ship, but manned by the Coast Guard. Mm -hmm. So because we were under the Navy during wartime, which is the uh, way it is, um, co Coast Guardsmen could be found on, the, on different shores, not just America's shores. While you were in, in training, uh, did you go out on boats then or just later on in your career? Later on, yes. It wasn't uh, at first. It was about a year before I did. And then I went aboard the ship. It was a very large ship. We brought uh, 5,000 soldiers back from Japan. Uh, oh, really? At yes. that time. So, uh, Can I ask you if you knew how to swim? Oh, yes, I did. <laughs> and we, had, we were given that kind of training, too. I, th I believe every sailor had to pass that, even if it was just the dog paddle or something. But I, I, I was able to swim. Were, you, uh, were any of your friends in, in training with you? Or no, did you pretty I, much go it alone? Uh, I didn't uh, get sent with any of my friends, no. One fellow uh, with whom I went all through high school uh, um, was on a uh, Coast Guard cutter up in the North Atlantic. And, uh, but no, I, I made friends with the people um, at the academy and at boot camp, but I didn't know any of them before I went in, no. Did you develop any uh, close friendships? with the fellows you went through boot camp with? Well, with a couple, and especially one uh, uh, who visited me and I visited him after we were discharged. He lived in Pennsylvania and then moved to Florida later on in his married life. But we, we, made, we were contacting each other for, for a while. It wasn't a long while, maybe a couple of years, two or three years, and then have just you sort lost, of dropped it. Yes, lost that, yeah. I believe he's in Florida, yeah. but I have lost contact. Can you tell us about the uh, the advanced training you received after you, uh, you did the, your stewardship, as it were, mm -hmm. what kind of training did you receive after that? Well, it was, um, it was um, more of the same, but advanced. You know, steward's mate does kitchen work, and uh, we served cadets, uh, we made beds, uh, we cleaned, and that sort of thing. 
Um, in fact, a little aside, uh, we were given a hard time by the Navy Shore Patrol when we would go out on liberty because at that time, um, white fellows were not accepted in the Navy as stewards mates. That is, they, they seemed to use other people, Filipinos, uh, so on, black men. And um, it, it was unusual for them to see a sailor without either a white stripe on this shoulder or a red stripe on this shoulder, because the steward's mate had neither. And uh, so we'd be downtown in, on Liberty, and the shore patrol would, uh, would give us a hard time. Really? Saying they, we were out of uniform. They were that alert? <laughs> well, yes, because we had the cross keys, which a steward, our coast guardsman does, yeah. on the uh, arm. But, uh, um, uh, In your, in your training, uh, what did you like about it? Well, I've learned some valuable things, frankly. <laughs> just, uh, just living. I think my wife could tell you that uh, it's probably uh, good that I uh, had some of that training. Though I still desired to have different training. And when I got aboard ship, if it's okay to tell you about that now, when I got aboard ship, uh, one of the officers there um, gave me an opportunity to work with the storekeepers and uh, I was delighted. So he um, moved me from the steward's mate group to the storekeepers aboard ship and put me in charge of a clothing locker and made it possible for me when we got back to uh, San Francisco and the ship was going to be turned back to the Navy. I went through storekeeper school in, at, um, in Alameda and uh, I, I was just really delighted. Would you describe what a storekeeper is and the well, kind of work you did? Certainly. We, um, I mean, they took care of uh, the various supplies aboard ship, you know, ordering supplies and storing them uh, properly. And uh, in my case, uh, I uh, inventoried the clothing supplies and sold them in a little a little store aboard ship to uh, anyone who needed a t-shirt or a hat or a pair of trousers mm -hmm. or whatever, dungarees. And um, so it was that, it was supplies, clothing and food supplies and other supplies that, uh, that um, were aboard ship that the storekeeper would be in charge of, take care of, make available to those who needed it. So and it, was, uh, it was interesting. I, I, I was delighted to work with them and as I say went through storekeeper school when I got back to shore mm -hmm. and uh, studied real hard and I, I was supposed to be uh, rated as a third class storekeeper, a petty officer at that time, but uh, the rates were frozen and, and I was given a seaman first class rating with a storekeeper striker badge. But I hung on to that and that was one of the reasons why after being discharged that I en enlisted in the Naval Reserve. I wanted to keep that rating. Mm -hmm. And because um, uh, I liked the military, both Coast Guard and Navy, and, uh, and uh, I really enjoyed the discipline, the uh, uh, comradeship, uh, so on. You've liked everything you've spoken about so far. Really? I've got to ask you, is there anything you disliked about what you were going through? Not really, although keep in mind, I was always looking for an opportunity to move from the initial kind of work I was uh, given. And I finally, it finally happened. Um, now my dream had been to fly and I've, mm -hmm. I've not done that other than uh, in high school I took a few lessons. but. Uh, that just wasn't possible in the military, and that never happened. But um, um, I was always looking for an opportunity to move from being a steward's mate, though I, I enjoyed it. I have a wide range of interests. I enjoy most anything I do. Okay, <laughs> that's nice to know. You spoke uh, just a little earlier about getting on a big ship and going mm -hmm. to Japan. Mm -hmm. um, did the military prepare you for the uh, cultural differences you might face as you left the United States? Not really. I don't, um, I don't remember being briefed at all. In fact, uh, we were facing that on the crossing, not just when we got to Japan, because we brought, we brought 
Um, I don't know the exact number. I know we brought 5,000 soldiers back, so the ship was capable of carrying a large number of people in addition to its uh, uh, officers and men, but um, we carried Japanese-American civilians, repatriating them to Japan. And in fact, uh, I don't believe I realized the significance of it at that time. I was 18, I think. But um, I made friends with one um, high school age uh, Japanese-American boy, and uh, we were kind of good friends on this 10-day crossing. But it was sad, he had never been to Japan. But his uh, family had been interred in our country during the war. And um, because apparently it was felt they would be loyal to Japan. So he was moving with his family to Japan. And uh, as I say, I don't think I re really realized the significance of what was happening. But later on, I've reflected on it and thought it was kind of sad in a way. In fact, I still have his pocket knife and he has mine, I assume, and I, I've never had contact with him again, but I wish I did, frankly. Where did these people board the ship, though? In uh, Seattle. So they were West Coast Japanese? Yes, they were West Coast Japanese. Had they been American citizens previous to this? Well, this fellow had been born in, uh, in America. I can't really tell you whether his father and mother were American citizens or not. Did they I think voluntarily they were. choose to go to Japan? I think they may have. I think they may have. Of course, he was not in on the decision, I'm sure, but I think they may have. Do you remember the name of the ship you were on? Yes, it was the USS General G.M. Randall, AP-115. AP? Yes. And your services on board that ship were as a storekeeper? I went on as a steward's mate, and yeah. then in the crossing, I was transferred to uh, storekeepers. Uh, it was a 10-day crossing, I believe. From Seattle? From Seattle, yes. Yeah. Went the northern route. It was a little shorter that way. And rougher, right? It was rough. <laughs> <laughs> this was December. <laughs> yeah, that's a tough, <laughs> tough voyage to make. It was cold. Yeah. What did you do on board the ship with <clears throat> all these people? And were you getting ready for, did you know you were bringing back 5,000 Americans? I don't think I did, tell you the truth. I'm not sure that was told. But we had drills. I was on a five-inch gun crew where we would uh, load and, and fire this gun out in the Pacific. We Can you remember the dates of this voyage? Yes, this was um, uh, around December 1945. So the war in the Pacific had been over it for had been over, yes. three or four months And we were going time. over, I'm sure, to bring back these soldiers. Yeah. Some would stay, but some were being brought home. Were you allowed to get off the ship in Japan? Yes, but a uh, very short time. <laughs> Um, a third of the ship can go off at any one time, and um, we were there just three days, and I got off one day. What port were you in? We were in um, Yokohama. I mean, Yokohama. Yokohama. Sorry, Yokohama. Yeah. And uh, we had to be um, back before dark. We could only go ashore during daylight time. Did you see any of the uh, destruction? Uh, yes. In yes, the city. Sir. My, uh, a couple of friends and I went up to Tokyo, and um, you could see it everywhere, rubble. Uh, maybe it had been piled up and so on, but yes, there was a lot of destruction. Mm. Yeah. What, were your, uh, what, what were your feelings about that, or what, what well, did you think about that? Well, I, um, you know, Japan attacked us. <laughs> and. Uh, I feel we had to do what we did, that um, uh, I, I felt okay about it. I don't feel good about anybody being hurt or killed, but I mean, I, I feel we, we had to retaliate, and we, and we had to uh, do whatever we could do to win the war and stop the, stop the war.
This soon, uh, so after, so soon after the end of the war, you're an American in Japan. Did you feel um, threatened? Well, I felt a little bit, but I think it was somewhat because of the circumstances. We could only be there during daylight hours. Yeah. Um, and um, it was uh, the, the, uh, the railroad that we used to go from Yokohama to uh, Tokyo, it was very crowded. And uh, you know, you just didn't know. You could see the result of war everywhere, so, uh, so you didn't know. So yeah, there was a little wariness, I guess, that yeah. we, we felt. Did you feel you were uh, clothed properly and uh, that your ship and uh, you and the other fellows that went ashore were uh, prepared for the climate at that time? Oh yes, yeah, oh yes. Yeah, we we uh, I think we were, felt we were taken very well care of as as sailors. Were you briefed about what you might do ashore? Or um, I don't recall very much emphasis on that. Uh, one thing that was kind of sad as we approached the harbor to dock. Um, Japanese men were coming to meet the ship and sailors were flipping their cigarettes uh, overboard, you know, and they were scrambling to get them. And we were, we were only allowed to bring two packages uh, off the ship. And yet, as, the, as you went by the SPs, they had a big pile of them here because others, I didn't smoke at the time, others, other sailors were uh, trying to get, bring more out. But you could get, uh, like 20 yen, I think, for each package of cigarettes or each candy bar, but you were allowed to bring only two of, of those ashore. But um, I don't, I don't recall any um, or much in the way of uh, the um, officers, our leaders, um, cautioning us. But I still, as I said earlier, felt a little. Wariness. You saw the destruction. You saw the results of war. The, uh, there were crowds of people, and of course, you you didn't know. But uh, mm -hmm. uh, we weren't there long. So, tell us about the trip home. Well, it was a little more pleasant in one way because uh, now I was had a new kind of job, and uh, and that was good. And we had uh, we were going home. Uh, however, we it was it was more crowded because uh, we had about five thousand soldiers, as I say, with us, and and they um, they had to have a presence aboard the ship and and be around. Uh, I remember meeting a soldier who lived in uh, Michigan at the time, and he he would I would I gave him a sailor hat and a, a jacket so he could get in the library and and things like that, and had a little more freedom aboard the ship, so. Uh, uh, I got to know him a little bit, and that was that was good. But um, and although we left from Seattle to to go to Japan, we were coming back into San Francisco, and and then it was I was looking with anticipation for going to the storekeeper school. So a little more pleasant, I guess. Mm -hmm. uh, Do you happen to remember or uh, these five thousand troops were? At Obviously, occupation troops in Japan. Yes, yes. Do you remember what outfits they were from? No, I don't. No. And these were all army. These are all army. Yes, yes, yes. And they were everywhere. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I can imagine. <laughs> Tell us about the big moment when you sailed under the Golden Gate Bridge. Well, it was, it was really kind of a thrill. Yeah. You know, I had only done it that one time. But it was, uh, it, of course, the anticipation of getting back to uh, American uh, soil, and well, although I hadn't been away very long. And, uh, uh, and in my case, the, the idea of going on to school and, and so on, it, uh, it, was a, it was a pleasant moment. I'm sure we all stood out on deck and and watched uh, as we as we uh, sailed into the harbor. 
it was it was good. Either for yourself or uh, vicariously seeing these other guys coming home, um, who met you at the dock and how were you received? That's very hazy. I don't, I don't know. Um, there were probably plenty of uh, relatives meeting these soldiers. Of course, in my case, that wasn't. We didn't have anybody. I uh, I spoke of my brother with the CBs a while back. It turns out that he was his unit was supposed to be um, at Treasure Island, and I remember when I I got to shore, trying to find him, but I I never did. But uh, I don't recall whether they're dignitaries or or who met us. I imagine we lined up along the rails uh, on the top deck there, but I, I don't, that's very hazy. Now you, let's see if I get this right, uh, you were in the Coast Guard, uh, and this is about the time you got out of the Coast Guard? No, uh, no. there's, uh, this was like um, maybe the end of January or something in, in 1946, okay. and I'm going to storekeeper school which was, uh, I think, like six weeks or so. Where was that school? That was in Alameda, California. Okay. And uh, following graduation from the, that school, then I was sent to a Coast Guard warehouse in uh, Louisiana, Algiers, Louisiana, just off uh, the coast from New Orleans. And uh, it, was there, it was from there that I was sent home to be discharged in Boston. In, a, in May of 1946. Tell me, uh, you're in school learning to be a storekeeper. Right. Um, how do you prepare? Um, 5,000 guys coming aboard your ship for a voyage of 10 days. Mm -hmm. you, do you, how do you shop for a thing like that? I don't know. <laughs> I was, uh, I had just joined the group and I was working in that clothes, clothing locker. Yeah, but I, but I, mean, I don't know, school, but I mean... They, is that why you went oh, to school? Oh, in school, sure, that's true, yes. Well, how you how do to, you do that, a thing like well, that, the logistics to, of a thing like you that? You would have to order the uh, foods that you would need and uh, have them stored away properly so that, so that you could take care of these soldiers when they, uh, when they came. That all was done, of course, ahead of time. The ship was ready for them. But uh, yes, that would somebody had to figure all that out. Is there a list? Um, Five thousand people, ten days at sea. These are the following things you oh, should. Oh, sure. Yes, I'm sure there's some formula that these uh, the officers would have used to to uh, get that all set before they left mm -hmm. Seattle, before the ship left Seattle. Yes. You've said several times and stored away properly. Well, what does that mean? Well, if something needs to be kept cool, then it has to be kept cool. If something has to be refrigerated, it has to be refrigerated. So they would have to, it depends on the foods, of course. But um, if something has to be kept dry, then it's got to be in that kind of storage area. And um, so that's what I really meant by it. I take it you've also got to be able to find it. <laughs> you've got to be able to find it. And you've got to keep a good inventory. When you yeah. use some, you've got to know what's left, of course, and not use more than you ought to at a time. So yes, I, but I think that's carefully planned out before uh, the ship leaves on such a voyage. And in Algiers, then, what did you do? It was a Coast Guard warehouse, and although there, wasn't, uh, there weren't quarters for us, there were several of us uh, there um, who had to, we had to room, we had a room in a rooming house. And, uh, but we were in, uh, mainly, uh, well, in a sense, guarding the, the supplies that were in this warehouse, but also uh, um, shipping them where, wherever they would be needed. So we were filling orders and, uh, and uh, receiving supplies too and storing them. Um, that was, uh, it was, it wasn't, I wasn't there very long, but it was, it was pleasant duty. 
to be there because we you had New Orleans as a liberty town. That's right. Yeah, that's right. That was that was pleasant. And, and we, where did you go from there? Then back to Boston. Okay. I was, I was discharged then. So this is forty six, and yep. you're out of uh, the service. Right. Well, I'm into the reserve. Yeah, okay. I that's, that immediately. That, that's yeah. your next decision. Uh, yes. You joined the Naval Reserve. Yes. Um, why Why did you do that? Well, mainly because I, you know, I did like the military, and if if I ever needed to serve again, I wanted to protect the rate that I had finally gotten, and. Um, I was for a while merely carrying my a card around in my pocket as a naval reservist. I went to college and uh, went to graduate school. I'm still just carrying a, a card. I'm a seaman in the naval reserve. But then the Korean War uh, came on, and I thought I wanted to join. And I didn't. I was beginning to teach in Melrose, and I wanted to uh, join an organized unit which I did at the Fargo building in Boston. And I was in a cargo handling group, I think, first. Um, and um, then I was selected to study Russian with a group, which I did. And then, um, then I was um, being interviewed by a, uh, an officer who felt um, that maybe it didn't fit well together that this man is married, teaching, has a master's degree, and he's a seaman. <laughs> that maybe he ought to be uh, an officer. And I, uh, I told him that I probably would not be able to get a commission because I have a color difficulty. And, um, but he said, well, take the test anyway. So then I became an officer. And uh, then I, I was able to, the, the intelligence unit in Boston was just building up. And uh, they had been meeting only like once every other week in civilian clothes, but they were planning on meeting every week. And I'm telling you, I was in seventh heaven because I joined that. And I, be, I was a lieutenant junior grade in, in naval intelligence. And from, I just stayed with that group and went from there. And I've retired from, from that. I'm a commander now, and uh, retired. So, uh, can we go so back I, just a second? Sure. Uh, when you joined the Naval Reserve, mm -hmm. w was that distinct and apart from a Coast Guard Reserve? Yes, I don't recall ha hearing much said about the Coast Guard Reserve. It wasn't that that I would not have joined that. There was one, but I don't remember. It somehow it escaped me. Mm -hmm. but I just knew that I did have a strong feeling for the Navy. I had wanted to enlist in that uh, at the outset, you know, and I wanted to fly with them. But um, um, it just seemed here was my opportunity. Quotas weren't quite the same, and I simply signed up in the Naval Reserve as a seaman first class storekeeper, and I just wanted to keep that rate. I didn't want to step back at all. and. Uh, and uh, so that was it. But I, whether if, if it had been, and it must have been presented uh, to me, but I don't recall it, um, why I would have joined, why I didn't join the Coast Guard Reserve at that time, uh, I'm not sure, except I know I had strong feelings for the Navy. Considering that you wound up a commander in the Navy, I think you made a good Oh, I am. It's just <laughs> been such a wonderful experience for Can me. Can you tell us about um, studying Russian? Was yeah. this uh, part of the intelligence quotient of what you did? Well, not at first, because I started as an enlisted man first. Uh, mm -hmm. When I went into that organized unit, they, um, uh, it was um, uh, the Naval Security Group was the unit that, that it was called, but they were selecting some men to, to uh, learn that. And in the security group, we, uh, communications technician uh, really is what we were, I guess. Uh, we were learning uh, coding and uh, decoding, encoding, and uh, uh, learning the Russian language at the same time. But uh, when I joined the, um, when I became came commissioned, actually I lost my billet. The Navy does it differently than some other branches, I think. Once I was commissioned as a, a Lieutenant JG, 
I lost my billet as a sailor in that communications technician group, and I had to look around for one. And um, it was then what I, that I learned that the um, Naval Intelligence Group was just beginning to uh, meet more often and to, uh, to, uh, to grow. And so I was interviewed and was selected for that. And uh, now it was after serving uh, in that group for a while that they decided they would start a language group. And I was able to get be a part of that. And we were translating an original book on uh, weapons from Russian to English. But I was only with that group. It was near the end of my uh, career before I retired. Um, maybe two years, two, three years I was with that group. And we had an officer who was fluent and he was teaching us conversational Russian actually. In fact, we went, uh, we drilled for a while, I think it was uh, two semesters at, in the Harvard University Extension courses, Russian one and Russian two. And, um, and then he taught us as well in the, uh, in the uh, Fargo building, the Navy. So um, uh, that was all I did with that. But it was interesting. It was interesting to study that and to learn that. Although I found translating uh, that book very, very difficult. And, uh, you know, we would do a page, it would take us hours and hours to do a, a page because it was so technical, I guess. So your, your time in active service and then in the reserve, the emphasis and the focus of your career totally changed. Oh, yes. Into something that you, you really enjoyed. Very much. Have you much. made use of this skill? Uh, I'm afraid in not. In your civilian I, life? I'm afraid not. At the dinner table, I might say, paradigm in your soul, <laughs> but uh, not, uh, not very much, really. Um, I, uh, I'm sorry about that, because you lose it very quickly if you don't mm -hmm. uh, use it. And, um, but uh, but I, I did enjoy the Total, my total military service, very, very much. Well, that's what I'd like to ask you now. Um, you had a, quite a varied career and a very interesting one, and you got to travel. Mm -hmm. um, can you tell us what might have been the most memorable experience in your career? Well, I think now uh, my time spent with uh, that Japanese-American boy would have to stand out as is probably uh, uh, a very important, very memorable uh, time for me. Why, I just why wish do you I say could. That? Well, I just uh, I've I've often wanted to uh, look him up, though I don't even I didn't make note of his name even, you know, and uh, I would just like to know how his life has gone. Um, having been in guidance work, you know, I'm interested in people. And I would like to have just known how it went for him and what and kinds of things he did yeah. uh, when he got to Japan and uh, what his family is like now and that sort of thing. Did he ever return to the United States? Maybe he did. But uh, that's probably the single uh, event that, has, uh, that stands out in my mind. Though there are many, many, you know, I really enjoyed the work in the Navy and um, enjoyed the men. It was like my fraternity. In college, I didn't belong to a frater fraternity. And I didn't join other veterans' organizations. This did it for me, because I was there uh, into my 50s, you know. And um, I just, uh, that was my fraternity. And uh, um, I just enjoyed, they were, they were professional men, most of them as officers, you know, they were lawyers and teachers, there were many other teachers and, and uh, it was just, it was just a lot of fun and very rewarding. Would you say then that that boy or that particular contact 
was your most memorable character in all those years? Um, yeah, I'd say that. Mm -hmm. Was there a humorous experience in all those years that you might tell us about? Well, uh, uh, probably not, although uh, like the s soldier coming back from Japan on the ship who had the use of the library, so did this fellow, and I'm sure that wasn't proper, but uh, nevertheless that gave uh, this fellow that gave him some freedom aboard ship to go into places where maybe he wasn't supposed to go. It wasn't anything classified or anything, but I mean the, the, uh, he had a little more freedom aboard ship and maybe, I don't know, maybe there's a side of me that feels, well, we, it's, it's some fun to do something, I suppose, yeah. sometimes that you're not supposed to, but I don't know. I think you said a moment ago you didn't join any veterans organizations. No. Can you tell us uh, why or why not? Well, I think, uh, as I say, the all during the time when I might have done that and was invited to do that, I was uh, drilling with the Navy, and that was my veterans organization. Many of them were veterans. But that was my fraternity. That was my men's group. And uh, as a teacher, as a guidance counselor, I never felt the work was done, so I never felt I had a lot of extra time. And raising three children, you know what that is, I'm sure, and having a home and so on. There wasn't a lot of extra time to do things, and that, that did it for me. That was my, uh, that was my men's group, I guess. So, uh, how important to you was serving in the military? Very, very important. I don't see how I could have not done that, um, especially when our country had some some problems to solve. Mm -hmm. And um, with my father having served in World War One, and my older brother, and um, you know, I can't I can't remember a friend who didn't. Go. I, I, I could not. There's no way I could not have stayed out. I mean, it was important to me, very important. I'm proud to say that I served. I'm, I'm sorry for those who had real difficulties in terms of, you know, getting hurt and so on. I'm thankful that I didn't, but I was always ready to. To, uh, to be a part of any of that. I've never shied from it. We've always had to say in the reserves, we're ready to go, you know, and I joined an organized group during the Korean War thinking that, well, if we needed to go, we'd be going, you know. And um, so it, it was important to me. I could not have avoided it. It's a great country. Can you tell us how you might think of um, how you were met when you came home and your experiences of having served uh, in active duty and then all those wonderful years in the reserves, public opinion looking at you and then how you know veterans in other wars have been received. Would, mm -hmm. Could you comment on that? Well, I thought we were received very well. You know, I felt um, in coming home, my family and friends, the neighbors and so on, always thought well of us. And I'm just um, aghast and sorry that that hasn't always been the case uh, in, uh, for men and women coming home at other times after serving in other conflicts. Um, because I thought everybody was very much in favor of what we were doing uh, then, and I, I didn't see nearly as much as many people did. But uh, it just, it, it's. Um, I feel it's 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 a shame that uh, uh, public opinion has been what it was during 
some of the other conflicts. And uh, freedom of speech being what it is, that's, that's okay, but um, um, a man at, during, we ought to always appreciate what a man or a woman is doing uh, in a, uh, in a wartime situation, you know, and uh, um, I, I just feel somewhat ashamed, frankly. I've never felt that way myself, and you could understand I wouldn't, having voluntarily been a part of the military in one way or another over so many years. But, but uh, yeah, I don't think it's, I, I don't think it's right. Lou, there's a um, couple of minutes left here. Mm -hmm. Is there any one thought or um, any memory or one overarching thing in your mind that you'd like to tell your family or people who will watch this tape in the future? Well, you know, I, um, in Natick now, there's a coalition of organizations uh, formed by Father Dan Toomey uh, called Joining Hands for Peace, and I'm a part of that. And I want us to all seek peaceful solutions for any conflicts that we have. I'm uh, happy to be a part of that. Um, however, I don't see how we can ever avoid having a police force in Natick and a police force in the world uh, my answer to that would be to um, to get all the countries together. I know we, we try to do this in one way or another, but let's make it very clear what countries want peace and urge them to be willing to support it with manpower, woman power, a police force. But when we see a conflict, I would like us to smother that conflict with, with power as opposed to just meeting it. Sometimes in the past we have, uh, we've, we've been called upon to put down a uh, conflagration somewhere, but we sometimes just meet it. You know, if you and I were fighting and uh, you brought a friend in to help, that wouldn't make me stop, but if you brought in ten to help you, that would stop it right then and there. And that's the kind of thing I'm talking about. So although I want us to always seek peaceful solutions to our conflicts, I want us to stop the fighting right away, <laughs> immediately, by smothering it. You know, so I'm in favor of, of military, uh, a military force and an active one and a strong and a well-prepared one at all levels, in the air, on the sea, on land. and. Um, uh, I'm just happy our country uh, does that as much as it does. And I hope we don't, as a citizenry, want that to, to be otherwise, want that to stop. I want us to be strong. And I think we have a responsibility, just like the police department here in Natick, we have a responsibility to keep order and to keep people from fighting, keep people from getting hurt. And. Uh, so that's my thoughts on it. <laughs> All right. Is there anything I haven't asked you that you felt as you came in today you would like to say about your service? No, I don't think so. It's been very, very complete. Okay. Very nice. thank I, I thank you very much for having come in. You're, uh, you're a very articulate spokesman for the uh, experiences you had. Thank you. And we welcome you into the club. Thank you. I'm pleased to be a part of it.